aware. Does that does that mean I can't curse, Andrea? Well, you can. I'm not it's supposed that. to. There's no hiding from it. Jesse Ventura would disagree with you. Hi, Ray Spells. Nice to see you. I miss him. He was fun. Remember when we thought that was as crazy as things were going to get in politics? It was a simpler time. <laughs> How you doing, Rachel? I'm good. How are you? Wonderful. Good to see you. It's good to see you. People are starting to pop in. Hello, Frankie. Nice to meet you. Hello, nice to meet you. There's Jennifer. Hello. Hello. So we're at 10. So we have two to three more people that we're expecting to join us. Like I said, I believe somebody might be coming in at 630. I think you're muted, Andrew. I can see your uh, lips moving. Sorry, I was talking to one of my children. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, we're we going to say if, if people have the ability to have their cameras on and their mute turned off so that we can have a, a conversation, that's great. But at the same time, we understand that if there are sounds behind you that you need to block, we perfectly understand that as well. Um, but we really want to hope that you know, our goal is to make sure we're having open dialogue from start to finish. Full disclosure, the toddler is off to gymnastics. The teenager is here. So between those two, uh, if I disappear, you should know it's for some good and probably dangerous reason. <laughs> Perfect. So I think we should get started. I will share my screen right now so we can start with the presentation. Can everyone see that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yep. So, you know, here we are. We're here to talk about urban design. And the, the purpose of the meeting is we're going to, you're going to find this, that there's going to be a lot of um, information coming out of this session as well as the next two sessions and from there I think Tiffany will explain to you a little bit more in detail how then we're going to have this opportunity to be much more interactive that we have to sort of set the stage to really kind of show where we're at right now what are the what are the parameters we have to work within what are the areas where we have to gather community input um, and, and that's where we'll start putting pen to paper so the goal is to then also develop a basic understanding of urban design concepts and help everyone understand what we're trying to get out of these meetings. So what will be the deliverables that will come? So with that being said, I'm going to start by introducing the St. Paul Port Authority team, which includes two contractors um, that we have from LHB Design. So first, um, in the top left corner, that is Monty Hillman, and he is our Senior Vice President of Real Estate Development, and he is the one who is managing this project from start to finish. I am Andrea Novak, Senior Vice President of Marketing and Public Relations, so you've probably seen some of my emails coming through, so if you have um, questions about meeting logistics or things like that, please let me know. Next, we have Tiffany Navratrill, and she's a landscape artist, art architect with LHB, and she is focused on um, really managing the project from the contract side. And then we have Jess Vetrana, who's also on the team. And I'm going to unshare my screen for just a little bit, and I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves a little bit more and talk about their role in the project. So let me stop sharing. There we go. And why don't we start with Monty? Sure. Uh, hi, folks. I'm Monty Hillman with the St. Paul Port Authority. I've been at the port for 17 years. 
Um, before I was at the Port Authority, I worked on a project in the North End and Frogtown of St. Paul called the Great Northern Corridor, uh, which was an effort to replicate the success of the Phelan Corridor, uh, which I worked on in the late 90s. Uh, so most of my professional career I've spent working on the east side of St. Paul, frankly, uh, doing economic development, cleaning up brownfields, uh, these formerly contaminated sites, which the golf course is one. Um, I've spent the last 10 years uh, turning around the old 3M campus, uh, their world headquarters, right at Arcade and Phelan. Um, we uh, had a bit of contamination to clean up, infrastructure, demolition, et cetera. Uh, we've now completed that project. We've got two uh, three acre parcels left to sell, which are under contract, uh, and we will have succeeded uh, with bringing a thousand jobs back to that neighborhood. Uh, which is a little west of you guys, but still part of the greater east side community, right? Um, I come to this work with uh, from a lens of environmental justice. That's how I got interested in brownfields in the 90s. Uh, I was lucky enough to learn about that and get a degree and all that and now do it for a living. So um, sustainable development, sustainable design is really my passion and something uh, I bring to these projects. Um, urban design I'm fascinated with, but I'm not by any stretch of the imagination a designer. Um, and we really are looking forward to um, getting your feedback and co-creating the urban design aesthetic and urban design framework for this site. Um, you know, the Port Authority has done this kind of work since the 1960s, uh, starting on the West Side Flats with the Riverview Business Center. Um, and it looks like it was done in the 1960s, right? Uh, um, uh, Beacon Bluff, 10 years ago, uh, we were in a similar position in terms of community engagement. And for the first time since the 1960s, we came out, we created a design work group like this, and we got feedback and input and co-created what's co what are called the protective covenants that, from our perspective, control at a higher level than the city does the design of the site. Um, and that was the first time in our history we had really engaged in an open conversation in community about what do you want it to look like? What are you concerned about? What do you love? Um, and so uh, it's my intent to really further that and take that to the next step in this exercise and really appreciate all your time and effort and energy uh, and expertise that you bring to the table here. So thank you so much for joining us and I'm really looking forward to our time together. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. And again, I guess I'm gonna also mention too at any point in this process, if you have a question, um, you can either have ask the question or use the raise your hand button. And um, so we're not expecting you to just listen. If a question comes up, bring that out. But I'll transition over to Tiffany to introduce herself. Hi, everybody. I am Tiffany. It's very nice to be here. So thank you for having me. And I'm pretty sad that we can't do this in person so really looking forward to future meetings when we get to be more interactive hopefully and be able to stand around tables together and draw and scribble and rip it in half and start over again with something just a little bit better so i have been at my current firm for eight years and doing this for closer to 10. Um, worked on a variety of projects across the Twin Cities and throughout Minnesota, very much always focused on the public realm and how our projects are impacting not just the people who own the property, but the people in the surrounding neighborhood, the people who are walking by, the people who are visiting. I came to this profession because it is the perfect balance of art and science and people, because I don't think I could spend an entire workday thinking about just one of those things. So it's really exciting to be able to spend every single one of my days thinking about each one just a little bit. I have a background in the earth sciences and a lifelong interest in fine art. And in parallel to my professional practice, I've been an adjunct faculty member at the U of M since 2016 at the College of Design. And before that, I was an adjunct faculty member at the University of St. Thomas teaching geology. So it is a real pleasure to be here with a group of people who are here completely voluntarily and not because you have to take a required science credit. So thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm really very excited to be part of this design process with you guys. Great, and, let, and then Jess. Oh, Tip, that's gonna be hard to follow. Um, <laughs> I'm Jess Petrano. I work um, with Tiffany at LHB. I've been here for just over two years um, working as an urban and landscape designer. Um, prior to LHB, I, 
started out in architecture at the University of Minnesota, um, as well as urban studies. I worked as an urban planner in the Twin Cities for three years before going to grad school in Seattle. The Twin Cities drew me back, um, and now I've been here ever since working on um, similar projects to TIFF at scales as large as, you know, countywide down to the detail of a bench, just what the public is dealing with every day. And most of them are um, city-led projects with taxpayer money and engaging citizens to understand how how we can best serve them and how their dollars will work for them moving forward. And so I'm just very interested in the urban environment, like TIF, every level from natural to built. And um, I'm excited to help. You know. Oh, you just got muted a little bit, Jess. Oops, I touched my screen because I noticed some crumbs and I must have feeded myself. Um, <laughs> I live at this computer, but <laughs> I'm just excited to bring you guys into our world a little bit and teach you about urban design and work with you on making this a great place. Perfect. And so now we're going to get to know the rest of the group. And, um, you know, as you're all neighbors, we want to get to know a little bit more about you. And I have these questions on a slide, but I think I'm going to keep this screen open so we can see. Hey, all Andrea? Yeah. Hey, hang on one second here, because uh, your title doesn't do you justice. Uh, so I, I would like you to introduce yourself. People should understand a little more about your background. Uh, and Andrea has really been the tip of the, the spear, as it were, for community engagement for Hillcrest, really since the city's master plan engagement process ended more or less six months ago, kind of early this late this spring, early this summer. Uh, so she and uh, our team have been out on the east side quite a bit, um, doing the, the shoe leather work of building community uh, in this project. Oh, well, thank you. Yes, so I have, I, as part of the marketing team, I focus on a lot of the things that how do we make sure that the community knows who we are, knows what we're doing, how are we building a sense of transparency with the work that we're doing, and that has also become part of the community engagement has really come under that fold because as we, the city was going through the master planning process, there was a lot of community engagement happening, and I think there was some concern that community engagement was was ending with their process. And I we ha we're excited we have a couple of people that are from the CAC that the the city had, and they were part of that community engagement. And now they're coming on working with us on this second phase. We keep talking about there was community engagement for the master plan. And there's things in the master plan that are getting locked down, but now there's community engagement opportunities for the development plan. And so a lot of the, the things that my team has been focused on is how do we get out into the community and let people know that there are these two different processes that we are going to pick up where the city left off? How do we de decipher between the two? And then um, and, and we went through. So we had a number of um community meetings. Hopefully some of you were able to attend those. They were all at the Hayden, Heart, Heart, Hayden Heights Rec Center. Um, and then we also did some focus groups. So we really kind of dug in on specific topics to get a feeling for what the neighborhood was looking at, what they were wanting to see in that next development phase. And we also have um, a video that's coming out that we'll have 3D images that I, we can't take credit for. It's our partners at LHB that are putting those together. So I think one of the things that we've really heard in the community is that people want to see the pictures. Right now, if you look at the master plan, a master plan is blocks. It's boxes. It doesn't show you what's coming from the ground up. And so hopefully the end of this month, we're going to have those. And maybe I can even t tell this group, we have like a big, huge secret to share. Um, I think Rachel knows this big secret, but we went through a naming process for, for the development. And hopefully some of you saw that on social media. And we really worked with the community to say, you know, we can come up with a name, but it's not as authentic if we work with the neighborhood. And so we went through a number of different naming ideas, brought the committee down to the top three, put the top three out to the community, and this community will be the Heights. And the focus on the Heights is what we've heard is that this is, I'm just going to say maybe Rachel, you were in those meetings and helped drive that. So if you have five seconds to explain why this is the Heights. Putting me on the spot. Um, so being in that one meeting that we were discussing the names, um, it started to be clear that there's a lot of things that honor the history of the neighborhood that are 
caught, named the heights already um, within the neighborhood. It also is giving some credence to, um, we had a couple Hmong folks that were in the group that were talking about like heights and hills being really important to the like iconography of their people and wanting to kind of play homage to that, pay homage to that as well. So there's a few different reasons that we were kind of gravitating towards hills and heights and things like that. Um, with also having the really good point, someone had brought up that every town has a hill crest. So how do we differentiate just a little bit? Yeah. So, And to put that in perspective, like why it's a top secret is we decided that it really makes sense to let's roll out the name when we can roll out the images, which we're waiting for, so that it doesn't get lost, that we can kind of build some excitement around if when you see these pictures, we hope people will see that there's some positive things coming and that there's this new name and that we can do a splash together. So I, I do in, in respect to this group's work, I do want to make sure folks understand what you'll see here in a couple of weeks are concepts to show people the quality and the investments that's going to be made in the pub, public realm. They are by no mean final designs. They are LHB's best shot at what could be possible. Uh, and the amenities that we expect to develop, they are by no means final designs, but we really uh, were we were kind of taking it on the chin over having nothing but these big watercolor land use blobs that were not very attractive and not very descriptive visually for what people are going to see and feel when they live in this or visit this neighborhood. Um, so just know that uh, it doesn't preclude the work of this group. It's meant to sort of inform the community at large about the quality of development we intend to bring to the site. Exactly. Very well said. And so now we're going to get to know the rest of this group. So what I'm going to ask you is to share your name, how long you lived in St. Paul, what you love about St. Paul, and what motivated you to join this group. And so I'm just going to call on you in the order that I see you on my screen. So if Donna, you can go first. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. My full name is Donna Montgomery Peterson. I grew up in White Bear Lake. I taught high school in White Bear Lake for 34 years. State license while I was still teaching. Um, we hold a real estate license under um, Twin Cities Real Estate, which is a local, a small real estate company in Maplewood on the edge of St. Paul. What, I'm not going to call it St. Paul. Uh, the picture, the first picture you showed, I'm about a block from there. I, I live um, just a block, basically a block and a half from Hillcrest. I, uh, 1755 is my address, but I've lived, uh, it's across from the townhouses. Uh, which is north of Larpender, just half, just to put it in perspective, that old school building. Um, uh, my husband and his and his brother owned. That's now it's now a daycare, and so I was part owner of that for a while, but that's gone. But I've been in my house since 1980. We bought it in 85, 1985. So long, long time. But uh, I'm like I said, originally from Wiper Lake, but I have a vested interest in what's going on there because it's close to my doorstep and um, want to make a difference. Perfect. Thank you. How about Susan? I had to unmute. There's, <laughs> I am Susan Bergman. Um, I actually came, I'm a transplant. I came from, I grew up in Denver and came to college here and just kind of stayed in St. Paul. <laughs> Um, so I've been on the east side for 25 years. I actually live on um, the south and the east part of the lake, of Lake Phelan. So um, I'm kind of across the waters from, from where Hillcrest is. <laughs> um, why I'm interested in this, I actually just finished um, a master's degree in uh, urban and regional planning from the U. I did a pivot career shift here. And um, and so this, of course, this this was fabulous timing for me, right? Because now I kind of have some knowledge, so I'm a little dangerous because <laughs> I only have a little knowledge. Um, but it's it's in my basically my backyard, right? So this is this is pretty exciting, and it's also I find this really exciting the fact that um, we're able to redevelop land that had been previously you know slotted for for a golf course right but now we can actually build a community and uh tiffany i really liked what you were what you said 
the combining of art, science, and people. That that that's what kind of drew you to this line of business. And um, I I think right. I think that's fabulous because you you hit all the parts. And so I'm pretty excited to to be on this committee. So. Great. How about you, Andrew? Thanks. My name is Andrew Wise. I am also a transplant here. I grew up um, outside of Philadelphia and <clears throat> I've lived, um, you know, all over the East Coast, mostly Northeast, New York, Boston, all over the place. I went to uh, grad school in Providence, Rhode Island at Rhode Island School of Design. Um, and uh, that's where I got my architecture degree. Um, I work now in Minneapolis uh, for an architecture firm and work in mostly multifamily housing. So I have um, some, you know, periphery knowledge of <laughs> urban design and uh, sort of on a smaller scale, I guess. Um, I live uh, just a, a little less than a mile north of Hillcrest in North St. Paul. Um, I'm kind of in the little... Um, uh, northeast corner of um, the Goodrich Golf Course area, kind of the south part of North St. Paul. Um, so not that far away. I drive past um, Hillcrest all the time, going to and from stores and daycare and all sorts of places. Um, I've lived in North St. Paul since 2018, but before that I lived in St. Paul. Um, and uh, my wife and I, um, we moved here from Boston and um, she's originally from Minnesota. So um, she, when we were thinking about moving out here, she said, well, we have to live in St. Paul. That's, that's the only place I want to look. And so um, I had, you know, I didn't know much about it and I just fell in love with, with uh, St. Paul immediately. And when we were looking to buy a house, we, we looked all over the East side and, um, uh, we're actually kind of priced out of a lot of areas and there's a lot of competition. Um, and so we ended up in North St. Paul, a little bit farther out, um, but we love it here too. And I'm, I'm also a planning commissioner in, in North St. Paul as well too. So I have some of the, you know, city side experience as well too. So um, I'm excited. It's, it's uh, really kind of a, I mean, you don't see projects like this very often and um you know, to be able to kind of weave together neighborhoods again that have been sort of separated and ripped apart for a while um, and to provide more housing and, and um, life to a corner of the city is really exciting. So I'm really happy to be part. Great, thank you. And how about Jennifer? Hi, so I guess I will join the uh, transplant crew because I am also a transplant, uh, two-time transplant actually, because I lived in St. Paul for 10 years and then uh, moved to North Carolina for work for about nine years and came back and live in St. Paul again. Um, and I work for the St. Paul Public Library and have worked for the library a total of about six-ish years now. Um, and I am the branch manager over at the Hayden Heights Library, which is on White Bear Avenue and kind of in the thick of all of the wacky fun that we're going to be talking about. Um, and I love the East Side, um, honestly. It is a wonderful, diverse community, and it has so much opportunity, but it is also such an exercise in, in what urban planning in the past did wrong. Um, and I would love to be part of setting that some of that right and kind of re-knitting some of the corners of the community and also um this lovely library uh is got its charm but it is very much a child of the 70s um since it opened up in 79 and we are going through our own redesign process right now and we are um hoping to get funding for it we will see how that goes so 2022 should be exciting for all of that um but we want to make sure that the process that we go through is also um linked not necessarily enmeshed but linked to what's going on with formerly known as hillcrest um 
because that's going to be important too. Um, so you see, you kind of anticipate where the community is going and the services and structure, literal and metaphorical, that we'll need to provide for that. Um, so there, there are a lot of different reasons why I'm glad to be part of this group, but I am very glad to be here. Oh, welcome. And Rachel. Hi, my, my name is Rachel Finez Adal. I've already gotten the opportunity to speak, but I'll introduce myself now. Um, I was the member that was on the CAC. Um, so I was on the community advisory uh, committee for the master plan process that just occurred. Uh, so I am, and I acted as the liaison between the Greater East Side uh, Community Council and that board. So um, I've lived in St. Paul's for five years now I think I since I graduated from the U I'm also an urban studies graduate from the U um so yes we both know Paula <laughs> and um I yeah. <laughs> yes. um and what drew us to my husband and I to St. Paul is we just weren't Minneapolis people <laughs> and quickly fell in love with St. Paul that you get all the benefits of a city without the like almost pretentiousness of it. Sorry if anyone is a big Minneapolis person. <laughs> but um, uh, The reason why I joined this group is I think that it's really important that under built, built environment is really important because I think it impacts us so deeply in ways that we don't expect it to um, and many people don't realize. Uh, so that's a part of it. And I have to just echo basically everything um, that Jennifer had said about the East Side did a really good job of showcasing some of the things that were harmful to people in past urban design um, and a lot of the ways that we've been ignored. So that's kind of my interest in continuing my involvement with Hillcrest. So. Great. And then I don't know, Frankie, if you can hear us. I see that you're, you have your camera off right now. Yes, I can hear you. Hi, uh, my name is Frankie Torbor. Um, I actually grew up in the northwest suburbs, Brooklyn Center, Brooklyn Park. Came here, I haven't, I lived in on the east side for not even a year yet, actually. My girlfriend is raised here, um, so I kind of came here with her. We bought a house here and we've been living here since last year. Um, I studied uh, city planning or urban planning at Iowa State. So very much interested in the built environment, you know, urban urban design, you know, the social um, implications of design and planning and things like that. Um, so what got me interested in this uh, particularly is I think I saw the master plan or some plan from um, the Cunningham group a long time ago. And it kind of got me interested. I've been going on this on the website for since then, and this opportunity came up. And um, you know, I thought it would be a good thing to join and just kind of learn. I'm trying to learn more about urban design because I've even though I have a planning degree, I haven't really practiced planning. So I'm trying to, you know, trying to learn and hopefully I can learn a lot from here and see what what I can um contribute to the you know the design and and planning of this. This project. Get ready for a crash course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and hopefully, you know, we can see we've got people coming from all different perspectives and from different, you know, work experiences. Um, I would say that we also have a, a member of this committee who is not here today that is a business owner. We also have someone here that is a on the, on the committee who's not here yet who is a renter. And then we have also extended an invitation to someone who is in the um, philanthropic space. So really kind of getting a different mix of perspectives. But I am going to now turn this. Oh, I, I'm going to go turn it back to our presentation and kind of get us back on track from a timing standpoint. And just take a look and give you just a brief overview of the Port Authority. So we're an economic development agency. Can you see my screen? Yep. Perfect. Um, that we're here to expand the city's tax base. So that's a big part of this project is that 
by redeveloping, we're going to bring new tax dollars to the city, which then takes some of the dependence on residents who are, are, are already paying in. Um, we serve as a conduit to quality job opportunities. And so that's where um, we do get excited about the jobs that are coming. And we're also focused on um, advancing sustainable design and equi equitable development. And we just need to add that we are here also advocating for river commerce and we manage four ports on the Mississippi River that are right here in St. Paul. And so, as you've probably seen, the city's goal for this project is to bring a thousand jobs to the greater east side. And those jobs, as you'll hear as more people are talking, should blend with the neighborhood um, and really taking a whole new approach to this project than maybe what we've done in the past. And I, um, and, and I think Monty will probably talk about as well is that we do have some pretty yeah. high goals in place trying to make this a carbon free community. Um, and, and that's also another um, work group that we have um, that'll be talking about sustainability. And Monty, I just heard someone come in, but because I'm sharing my screen, I can't see. Do you have the ability to accept them? I did. Uh, Serenity just joined us. Perfect. Hi, Serenity. How are you? Hi. Okay, so we're going to then, I'm going to transition this over oh, to Monty. If he maybe wants to talk about Hillcrest in more specific details. Now, Monty is part of the planning committee, but because this is what he um, is headfirst into from a project management standpoint, I'm going to turn this over to him. Sure. Uh, you know, the quick background on this is the Port uh, Authority bought this site in 2019. Um, the Pipe Fitters Union had previously bought it from. Uh, the ownership group that had operated it as a private country club for many decades. Uh, it was built in the 1920s uh, to serve the Jewish community who was by and large not allowed to golf at other country clubs. Um, but for that many, many decades, uh, nearly 100 years, it literally was a private country club. Um, wasn't a park, wasn't open space, wasn't green space. Uh, you had to be a member or a guest of a member really to enjoy it. Um, the uh, one of the first things we did uh, when it was brought to our attention in the sale to the pipe fitters, the due diligence process discovered uh, some amount of mercury contamination. Um, we're more or less the buyer of last resort, right? The buyer of distressed properties that the marketplace can't figure out because there are likely contamination impacts, blighted buildings, etc. Um, so we did our due diligence and found there was much more mercury contamination on the site than previously known uh, due to a fungicide that was applied uh, through the 1970s or maybe into the 80s um, to prevent mold growth in the winters. Uh, we lost your, we lost the presentation, Andrea. Yep, I, I accidentally bought my keyboard, but it's back. Uh, it should be back. We, um, we did, uh, so we did our due diligence, realized it's more of a brownfield than anyone knew. Um, we did a market study uh, we discovered that the site uh, has the capacity to house a uh, thousand housing units uh, and also a thousand jobs. The jobs really is uh, another way of saying uh, light industrial building square footage. In the Port Authority's world, because we require a certain amount of job density, uh, literally a minimum of one job per thousand square foot of building. So we know that a 50,000 square foot building is going to deliver 50 full time living wage jobs to the site because we're not going to sell it to someone who's going to bring less jobs in that. That's just what we've done since the early 90s. Uh, and our track record at Beacon Bluff, the old 3M campus, which I mentioned earlier, is kind of proof of the pudding. Um, so the city is just wrapping up the master planning process, which deals with land use and kind of the broad strokes of development patterns. Um, and that uh, has come out of the Community Advisory Committee, uh, which Rachel was a member of in December. It is now going through Planning Commission. Uh, there will be a public hearing at Planning Commission tentatively scheduled for March 3rd, uh, and then it will weave its way through to a Planning Commission, uh, excuse me, a City Council public hearing, and City Council will have to approve it and affirm a variety of land use controls, uh, hopefully in May. Um, and it's really the roadmap. Uh, it, it really is the broad strokes of what is possible um, at a land use level 
where are the rights of ways? How are the streets connected? Uh, there, there is some aspirational stuff in there about uh, stormwater and sustainability and all kinds of other things. Um, but the master plan in terms of a land use zoning control is really about that ability of the city to regulate land uses, densities, locations of, of spaces and how they relate to each other and other publicly owned space. Um, next slide, Andrea. Yep. So I guess we'll kind of go into this. So, you know, as we kind of talk about, so your role here, this is your neighborhood, you're representing your neighbors. Um, it's true, there are some decisions that have already been made in the master plan, which Monty is going to, you know, focus on in a little bit. Um, but we're bringing this group together because you can help guide the decisions that have yet to be made. And that's what we'll also get into when Tiffany talks about the deliverables. So as we talked about, we'll be meeting twice per month. Um, meeting one, two, and three will be more informational in nature. But once we get to meeting four, that's where we're going to start putting pen to paper and having some more fun with this. And that's where we really do hope we're crossing our fingers that we can all be together in person, but we'll continue to um, to watch the, the, the numbers for COVID. So I'm gonna move this on to Tiffany so we can you can get an understanding of what it is that this group will be creating. Thank you. So there are three major products that we are hoping to produce here as a group. The first one um, and probably the most elaborate one would be to create a set of design guidelines in both written and graphic form that will eventually inform the covenants. So the covenants are a legal document that you can imagine being stapled to the purchase agreement when the Port Authority starts selling land to potential developers. So not only do they own this land now, but there's this other thing that says you have to do all this extra stuff in order to own and develop this land. So there are a lot of different things that we can explore as requirements that we may want to include in the covenants. We have examples from previous projects that we can rely on, but there is a lot of uncharted territory that we get to discuss together as a group, which we'll look at in just a little bit with an example. There's also the need to create additional documentation that applies to things that won't be sold to private developers. So more specifically, anything that falls into the right of way, so it will eventually be owned by the city of St. Paul rather than a private owner. We wanna make sure that we're documenting the recommendations of this work group in a way that we can communicate it to the Port Authority as well as to the city. And we all got together, we talked about it and we set these priorities for the right of way and we would like you to take this under advisement as you make your plans for what happens in the street versus what happens on private property. And the third product that we're going to be producing for our deliverables is a documented conversation, including the meeting minutes that Jess is taking right now, the recording of this presentation, the PDF version of this presentation. So it's all available online. So for people who aren't here today, they're able to see and hear and understand what we're trying to discuss and what we're exploring. Yeah, and I, I should add that tomorrow, these, I'm going to try to get some of the pieces of information on our website and then also a link to a Google Doc where we can start using as a group. On the next slide, we have an example of the covenants that have been used by the Port Authority in previous projects. And you can see on the bottom right hand there that it is a very legal looking document because it is a legal looking document and it's a text heavy document as well that a designer such as myself or as Jess, we would have to read this on behalf of the new owner on a parcel to say, what does all of this mean when it really comes down to design? So our hope is to convert something like this into what we see on the next slide, where it's a lot of graphics that are supporting these line items of requirements. All of these requirements that you're seeing would be need to be um, vetted to make sure that they're not in conflict with any existing requirements from any regulatory authority. So we cannot write a requirement into the covenants that's less strict than what's in the zoning code. We can consider requirements that are more strict than what's in the zoning code, but we cannot contradict it and we cannot undermine it. So that is something that 
we can dream big and then we can just cross reference to existing materials to make sure that we're not um, accidentally taking it in a direction that's going to be non viable. Does anybody have any questions about the covenants right now? They are uh, recorded with the title to the property at the time we sell a piece of property. They're recorded with the title to that property, so they are bound to the landowner and successor landowners uh, really in perpetuity. Private covenants uh, between private parties in the state of Minnesota are subject to a 30 year time limitation. Uh, city attorneys tell us that public covenants like this from a government entity uh, fulfilling its government purpose are not bound by that same time restriction. So these are pretty durable. Um, and I can tell you these covenants uh, have been above city zoning code in terms of restrictions um, to the point that about 13 years ago, uh, the I-1 zoning code was the lightest industrial zoning in the city of St. Paul. The Port Authority covenants for decades sat on top of that requiring better design, frankly, uh, more sustainability, et cetera. Um, to the point that we worked with the city about 12, 13 years ago to write the, the new zoning code, which is called Industrial Transition IT Zoning District, which incorporated a bunch of Port Authority stuff into the actual zoning code, which is light, light industrial, meaning no outdoor storage. You know, in an I-1 zone, you used to be able to do outdoor storage under city zoning. The Port Authority and most urban areas, you're not allowed to do outdoor storage because it tends to look junky and people leave crap laying all over the place, uh, you know, for a few decades now. So uh, this these documents have really improved in our perspective, the ability of the public and the private to meet in the middle and really deliver better design over the course of time. Okay. And I think that'll move into the master plan. So really kind of seeing what what our parameters are. So I'll leave that over to Monty. Sure. Um, so the master plan uh, really uh, is driven by the city's comprehensive plan. Uh, the master plan has to comply and basically be a manifestation of the city's comprehensive plan. The comp plan is a long term land use planning document. You can see uh, we're required, I believe, under state statute to submit to the Met Council uh, a 10 year plan uh, once every 10 years. So it's constantly being updated with this 10 to 20 year look in the future. Um, what the comp plan says about this site, Hillcrest itself is called out in the comp plan as I think an opportunity site, they call it. Um, it was ripe for redevelopment for years, uh, folks in the city knew. Uh, so it talks about creating neighborhood nodes. Uh, it, uh, it talks about goals about ensuring equitably, equitably distributed amenities, employment and housing choices, uh, providing a diverse array of infrastructure, uh, efficient, adaptable and sustainable land uses and patterns, uh, full time living wage jobs and people centered design. I think those are likely quotes right out of the comp plan. Um, this is uh, a master plan objective that really comes from uh, the necessary in order to do any of those things. Right now, there is so much contamination on site. It literally under federal and state, uh, CERCLA and MERLA, they're called environmental statutes. Um, it is not safe uh, to transact this property to another owner uh, because there is mercury in the upper three feet of the soil at levels that are not safe for human health or the environment. Um, this this chemical they applied, this mercury containing chemical they applied, they put it on here way more heavy than we found at other golf courses. Other golf courses have been redeveloped in the metro. Um, many of them have found this mercury, but generally it was only on the greens. And at this site, it's on the greens, it's on the fairways, it's in the tee boxes. Uh, somebody was a little gung ho with the sprayer uh, spraying this stuff on the grass. Um, so Braun Intertech uh, is uh, helping us do the investigation. The Minnesota Department of Agriculture, because it was applied as an herbicide uh, per label instructions, that means the Minnesota Department of Agriculture gets to regulate it. They regulate the cleanup of all these golf courses. Uh, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency will also regulate the cleanup because there are pockets 
uh, that there are non-mercury contamination, uh, petroleum spills, uh, building demolitions, the, the clubhouse burnt up at one point, uh, and there's residue, chemical residue from that burning of the building, et cetera. So we will clean it up uh, to levels that are safe for human health and the environment with the blessing of the state. Uh, Frankie, you got a question? I think you had your hand up. Yeah, you answered it. I was gonna say, who's um, going to clean it up? That, oh, that's, you know what, yeah. that's what we do. Uh, that's our specialty is brownfield cleanup and redevelopment. Um, and there are a number that state of Minnesota has really led the country since the early 90s in figuring out tools and processes, legal and financial, to clean up these sites. Um, we have 21 of these business centers around the city of St. Paul with uh, over 550 companies and over 25,000 employees. Uh, that were former brownfields that we've cleaned up over the last 30, 40 years. Um, the master plan, our agreement with the city, the city council with unanimous support in the administration was that we should develop a master plan that does bring a thousand new dwelling units and a thousand jobs to the site. Uh, for residential, that means about 25 acres from low, medium and higher density. Uh, the lowest being anywhere from potentially single family, but certainly duplex, triplex, all the way up through probably the densest you'd see at Larpender and McKnight is six story apartment building. Um, in our world, we specialize in light industrial uh, economic development. Uh, and to get to a thousand jobs, the math we use for a building density, uh, a floor area calculation, floor area ratio you may be familiar with. Basically, the building has to cover 35% of the piece of land, uh, which is generally twice as dense as you would see if these buildings were being built down in Shakopee or potentially in Egan or wherever. Um, but in our world, a thousand jobs requires about 55 acres, which is what the master plan that's going through for approval has delivered. Uh, we agreed very early with the city that we would deliver 15 acres of passive open space. This means the, the water you see there are preserved and mitigated wetlands, highly regulated and controlled by the state and the watershed district. So they basically have to stay in place. And we had to figure out a way to make the streets and the building pads work with keeping these wetlands in place. Uh, all of them except one are contaminated. So we have to clean them up, but we have to put them back together uh, basically where they were and some of them need to be expanded a bit. Um, but there'll be amenities and you'll see some of the imagery. Uh, we don't know what those amenities are. You could envision boardwalks and trails and all that. But other than some concept sketches that you'll see in the next couple of weeks here, none of it's been designed. Um, and five acres, this uh, this area in the upper left, uh, the big kind of pickle shaped green space, uh, that is a five acre active city park. So the parks department will have a future uh, design and engagement process around building a city park right there. Um, the master plan really kicked off two years ago. It was uh, October 2019 when I believe the Community Advisory Committee started meeting. Uh, there have been uh, open houses, pop ups. Uh, they've done their own surveys. Uh, Several hundred, I think actually over a couple thousand people have been touched by that process over the course of two years. Um, so the Community Advisory Committee uh, was run parallel with a Technical Advisory Committee, which was all the agencies, city departments and otherwise, county, uh, watershed, et cetera, that would touch and regulate this. Uh, they've all had their, their shot at this. Um, and the port there as landowner obviously uh, had its say, although we were not a formal member of the CAC or of the TAC, uh, but as landowner, we were permitted the graciousness of sitting in and raising our hand when we had an opinion. Um, next slide. So the, the master plan, just to be clear, has already delineated that land use uh, delineation, if you will, that, that, that allocation of land uses has been set in the master plan and will go through its approval process. That's not really what this conversation uh, in this group is about. Um, but some of the things that will touch this group uh, is certainly design, but also the integration of design with sustainability. Um, I'm a U.S. Green Building Council uh, board member here in the state of Minnesota, past president. Uh, I think I've told you sustainable design is my passion, my background. And so 
even as we were looking to acquire the site, we were being asked about sustainability and what are you going to do? Uh, you need to have some kind of sustainability certification. We looked at eco districts. We looked at lead for campus, uh, lead for communities, lead for neighborhood development, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we really found that lead for communities is the most appropriate uh, sustainability certification for the site. Uh, as it touches on about all of the different components that a land developer like ourselves would touch. And uh, the sustainability work group will go in deep on that front. If you're very interested in that stuff, um, that would be a place to to have those conversations. They certainly will dovetail with what we're doing here, but um, not explicitly a conversation about uh, sustainability here. Um, but certainly uh, right now, the site as planned within the context of the master plan is going through pre-certification at the platinum level uh, with the U.S. Green Building Council, uh, which is obviously the highest certification. Uh, there's only a handful of these in the country uh, and only a few dozen of them in the world that are certified at platinum. So it will be a very sustainable site regardless. Next slide, please. Uh, so one of the, nope, go back one. So uh, one of the very designy things we've been thinking about and have been rolling out to the community over the last four or five months here, um, presented it to District uh, 2 a couple of times. We've brought it out to some community meetings at the park, or at the, the rec center, excuse me. Um, you know, we have heard over the course of time that one story boxes are not very attractive and don't make people feel really great things when they walk past them. Um, these building types are generally a shell around a process. The businesses that bring these kinds of living wage jobs with low barriers to entry, they're making or assembling or repairing widgets. They've got materials coming in, they got to do a bunch of stuff and then they got finished product going out. So they're figuring out a material flow and kind of the last thing they're doing is putting a shell over it. And over the years, through these covenants, we've kind of twisted their arms in our contracts and our design review process at the port to make them build fancier buildings, right? Better architecture, more uh, more windows, more, as I think Tiffany would say, jigs and jags in the roof line, um, building articulation, uh, gingerbread, some people call it, right? Just throw an awning on it, and it'll make it look better. Um, at the end of the day, they want to be kind of big dumb boxes these industrial buildings are. So the team at LHB brought us this concept, hearing that criticism as we've heard over the years, we've talked about the last several years, the concept of amenitizing industrial space. The idea that employers that we like to attract want to be where employees are and employees wanna be around amenities. Um, so you see industrial developments bringing in uh, community spaces, breweries, stuff to activate these business centers for the benefit of the employees to help attract employees and retain employees. We put that thinking to work here and we've got the city on board with the idea that we would, we in our requirements and the city and their zoning requirements would be willing to step back from some of the hard and fast, you've got to articulate this building facade to in design speak a certain amount or a certain degree if we can employ an arts and employment district. And what we're looking at is large format murals, community-based art, community-based themes. Uh, we did some of this with the Eastside Arts Council, and we built a public plaza over at Beacon Bluff. You can find it right, right next to Vomella and the Eastside Family Clinic on East 7th Street. Uh, there are four, at least four, kind of four and a half large scale uh, public art sculpture installations. Uh, and a bunch of interpretive panels and programming, um, a real amenity for that business center. Uh, but this is that on steroids. Uh, so we really would be focusing dollars and investment in design from the building out to the sidewalk, rather than just twisting business owners' arms, trying to get them to put more switchbacks in their roof line, uh, which is expensive and doesn't really add a lot of joy. Uh, we think this arts and employment district could really add a lot more joy uh, to the neighborhood. So that's one of the things we'll explore with you guys more fully. Um, street design standards. This is another thing we kind of have to live with. So the master plan 
the, the top image is a page out of the master plan for Hillcrest. Um, and it says, already says, because we've got traffic engineers and sidewalk people and sewer, storm sewer people all in the room, and they all each need their part of the street, either at the surface or underground. So some of the allocation of the horizontal and vertical space in the street width, in the right of way we would call it, is been allocated to some degree. Uh, the master plan really talks about the sequence of operations, not necessarily how big these portions are or how they look. It just talks about the sewer guys and gals need six feet of space here and the sidewalk people want eight feet of space here and we got a trail over here and Lord knows we need some trees. So we got to save some space for the trees. So that's what the master plan says. This thing down below is called the St. Paul Street Design Manual. And it is a formal city document that they use to make sure all St. Paul City streets are safe, more or less. Uh, and that's kind of a hard and fast thing where we have to follow as well. Uh, but within those parameters, there's a lot of design yet to be done. And folks at LHB are chomping at the bit to get going. Uh, but we want your input in creating what this looks like. Um, next slide. Are we on to Tiffany? Uh, so timeline. Time. Yeah. Uh, so master plan approval, uh, hopefully by April, more like May, uh, the city council will approve the master plan. Um, that's important because we want to start turning dirt in terms of cleaning up things and grading, getting sites and roadways to the right elevation. Um, you know, the 14th tee box uh, has a slope on it like this, and it's about the size of a large vehicle at the top of it. Well, that's not very usable for anybody in the future, right? So we need to bring down the tee boxes a little bit. We need to bring the fairways up a little bit. We need to clean up all the contamination. There's about a year's worth of dirt moving out there. It's a lot of dirt moving. Uh, we want to start that this August. Um, that gets us ready a year from then in fall of 2023 to begin doing streets and utilities. Once we know where those streets and utilities are and we're ready to start building them, we literally could have private businesses and housing developers ready to start construction on development pads in late 2023 for building occupancy in late 2024. Um, and I can tell you we have uh, developers, industrial developers and business owners. Most of our work is with actual business owners. Uh, 50 deals in 25 years. All but six of them have been with an actual existing business that owns and operates in that building. About a half a dozen of them have been with developers who then build a multi-tenant building and lease it out to businesses. Um, but the owner user is really our sweet spot. Um, so uh, all of this is important to hit these timeframes uh, because we have a market that is ready to bring housing units and jobs to this neighborhood. Um, and to the extent we can't hit the market and get those folks here, uh, they will wind up going somewhere else. They'll go build their buildings in Lionel Lakes or Rogers or Egan or wherever. Uh, we'd rather have those jobs and tax base right here in St. Paul. Okay, so before we move on to some urban design principles, does anyone have any questions, comments, feedback? Okay. Well, then we're sort of the catch up. That's where that's how far we've gotten in the last two years. <laughs> yep. And so now take this is the kickoff. Let's start talking about urban design. And so Tiffany is going. This is our area of expertise, and she's going to show us some principles to keep in mind. Well, and it sounds like that a lot of people here are already pretty familiar with the basic principles of urban design: the good, the bad, and the ugly of it. So. We're hoping to lean toward the good side of urban design. Um, so we want to make sure that before we really get started with this massive brainstorming and refinement effort that we're all speaking the same language. So to start out with, here are some examples of recent housing and mixed use developments in the city of St. Paul. And I think these are all really nice examples of how far we've come since the 1960s. Uh, when people were taking a really different approach to urban design and we are now dealing with the 
consequences of that, you know, 50, 60 years later, where we have a lot of neighborhoods that are not serving our communities effectively. We have a lot of neighborhoods that don't have jobs anywhere. We have neighborhoods where you can't buy a gallon of milk to save your life. And this is something that we really want to see um, be improved upon for the Hillcrest site to make sure that it's not just a thousand houses and a thousand jobs, but a thousand great houses and a thousand desirable jobs that provide a living wage for members of the community. So let's move on to principle number one. We don't want it to be full of chaos, but we also don't want it to be overly ordered. When you have excessive disorder in your urban area, there's no relationship from building to building. There is an unclear relationship from the private areas to the public areas and the street. So sometimes when you walk by a, in an area like this, you're not really sure where you're even supposed to be because the delineation between public space, semi-private space, and private space is potentially incredibly unclear. And you end up having this skyline that looks really jaggy and like um, the resource material that this came from, they likened it to a bunch of broken teeth that were gradually falling out of somebody's cartoon mouth. So, and on the flip side of the coin, where you have an excessive amount of order, there's no individual character. And it's really, really hard to tell one building from another, and you end up having like, this soulless landscape. So, if we move to the next slide, We are looking at quite possibly the world's most quintessential example of what happens when you don't have zoning regulations in place. So Houston, Texas is famous for its lack of zoning code. And this is what happens when not only do you have no sense of zoning when it comes to uses that are acceptable in adjacent properties, but also when you have no sense of design when it comes to how buildings should relate to each other. So we have at least eight different buildings in this view and none of them really look like they have anything to do with any of the other ones. That's kind of a big old mess. And to compound it all, you have a streetscape that is fronted with an ocean of hardscape. And where does all the rain go when it falls on this parking lot? Straight into the storm sewer without any treatment whatsoever. So Houston is on one end of the spectrum. And if we flip over to the other side, next slide. This is the far other end of the spectrum where we have a lot of housing developments coming out of China in particular, um, all over the globe, honestly. But China has really nailed it when it comes to excessive order in a massive urban design where if you have to tell your friend, come on down, I live in the white one with red pillars, what you, they're never going to, they're not showing up for dinner on time, they're not going to be able to find you. So this is where we end up having too much order in a landscape in an urban area. And we want to make sure that we're hitting this beautiful golden median right in between the two. So the next slide has a great example of what happens when you strike a solid balance between something orderly and something that is unique and creative. When you have a consistency in building heights, more or less consistent building widths, you have a similar expectation on how the windows are placed within a building and how big the floors are, but lots and lots of variability in color and form and just general expression of those facade characteristics. You have a urban area that has a strong relationship to itself and also to the pedestrian realm down below it. So the next slide is just kind of summarizing where we're trying to go with this. So this is one example of how you hit that sweet spot right in the middle where you have consistency and height and width, but then a lot of experimentation in form and color. And the zoning code already does this to um, a pretty extensive degree. So this part has already been kind of baked into cities that do have zoning codes and St. Paul is one of them. So one of the questions and challenges for this group is, understanding the current zoning code requirements for the four different kinds of zoning that will be built into the Hillcrest Master Plan, but really focusing on the residential component 
um, that also has some mixed use capabilities there. And do we want to make something a little bit more stringent or a little bit more regularized? For instance, there is a, vari a variation that's allowed in the zoning code for the setback. So from the property line in the front yard, how far back does your building need to be? For some of the lower density developments, the setback can be between 10 feet to 25 feet. Now, for this group, do we want to just allow it to maybe wiggle in between that framework of 10 to 20 feet back from the property line? Or do we just want to say, nope, all of the buildings are going to be perfectly lined up and we're going to have this really, really uh, regularized look to the front facades, but each building gets to be really interesting and unique. So that's an example of how we might use the covenants and the recommendations that we're making here to achieve this middle ground. Has anybody been to Houston? Yeah, so you know. I think that if there was a definition of like urban design fail, it would just be dozens of random pictures from Houston in the dictionary. Like it wouldn't require any verbal explanation, Houston. So no offense if you're from Houston, but a little bit of offense. Um, visible life, that is the next thing. And it's a little bit more straightforward and surprisingly harder to do, in my opinion, when it comes to urban design efforts. So it is always a good idea to incorporate the goings ons of neighbors and just who lives there, who works there, and what are they up to, even if it's boring. And just as you walk by on the sidewalk, as you drive by slowly looking for a parking spot to make sure that there are signs of visible life. So people doing stuff. On the left hand side, we have City Hall in Boston, which is one of the more classic examples of this brutalist architecture from the 1960s where they forgot to include people um, in their thought process while they were designing this plaza, while they were designing this building. You can see those teeny tiny specks, like there's one or two of them kind of floating randomly in the middle of all of that uh, cobblestone brickwork. Those are people. That is how large the scale of that space is. So you can imagine if one of those people were walking down by the wall and the big grandiose staircase leading up into the building, they would really have no idea what kind of building they're walking by, what goes on in there. This could be City Hall, it could be a penitentiary, it could be a lot of different things because there aren't any visible clues as to what's going on inside, nor what you should be doing outside. So there are a lot of flaws with the architecture as well as um, the plaza design space. So alive, beautiful spaces. Grand Avenue is an amazing example of how it's actually really achievable um, to do this visible life piece of urban design really, really well. We move to the next one. <clears throat> Compact urban areas are always um, more successful in the long run than when they are sprawling out. There is an innate human desire to interact with people's neighbors, not all the time and not every day, but eventually people do like to go outside and say, hey, how are you? Let's go for a walk and go get a coffee around the corner. So when we see sprawling landscapes like on the left, they become isolating, they lack character, and they're extremely energy efficient inefficient as opposed to these denser urban places. And I think it's important to note in this example on the right that dense does not need to mean tall. So you can do a really, really dense, beautiful neighborhood without having super imposing buildings. But we create a lot of energy efficiencies this way and it encourages positive interaction with our neighbors. And the next slide. This is just illustrating again how that density does not automatically mean enormous buildings because there is a desire for this missing middle of housing where it's not a single family home and you're not living in a mid rise or a high rise apartment, but there are a lot of different options that we are hoping to include in the residential components of Hillcrest that address this missing middle component of the housing market. Scale. 
So it's always a good idea for buildings to have some kind of relationship to the building next door. And one of the easiest ways to do that, and one of the most straightforward for making sure that you're relating to the pedestrian realm as well, is to make sure that they're scaled about five to six stories tall, where it's optimally dense to relate to the pedestrian scale versus having a tiny building next to an enormous building, and they one just dwarfs the other. So on the next page, we have an example from New York. It, it would be adorable if it weren't so sad to have this cute little old building just being swallowed by these apartment buildings that were almost definitely built in the 1960s when they just decided that the way cities had been built for hundreds if not thousands of years was in the past and they were just gonna reinvent urban design from scratch. And this is where we landed with um, the 1960s philosophy of urban renewal. And they really miss the mark in a lot of ways on what it takes to make a, a viable neighborhood that is built for people and not for cars. On the next slide, Paris. So Paris is really, really focused on the public realm. It is probably one of the most globally well-recognized examples for being a walking friendly city. And not only is it built for people and very much not prioritizing the cars, but it's all of its buildings in these older districts of Paris have a really strong relationship to each other. So that fourth building back there, that's actually an urban infill project. Um, it was probably built after World War II when the building that used to be there probably was damaged beyond repair. So even though this is a new construction, it still has a really strong, beautiful relationship to what was already there. So you maintain this cohesive character throughout the neighborhood. Hey, Tiff, just a minute yes. of time here. Just note it's 713. Yes. Right. Um, and then the last piece of urban design principles, and in my opinion, one of the most challenging is to make it local. So I defy any one of you, I will give you $5 if you can guess where this is from. So unmute, give it your best shot. Some uh, suburb somewhere. <laughs> Raleigh, North Carolina. It looks exactly like Raleigh. Uh, Arizona. Arizona. What else? Some suburb somewhere. That's that's a good guess, yes. <laughs> Somebody else is muted. What do we think? I think if so many people are talking it, they're muted. Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. All good guesses. All probably true. There are all probably <laughs> neighborhoods in all of those places where you can find a neighborhood that's almost exactly like this. This is Atlanta, Georgia, actually. But it is hilarious and sad that you had just have no idea. Nothing about the buildings are giving you a clue. A lot of the landscaping really isn't giving you a clue. It's definitely in an area where they didn't prioritize pedestrians enough to build them a sidewalk. So we are in a place where people aren't expected to walk anywhere in a big hurry. Um, but this neighborhood lacks individuality. If we look at the next slide. We have four buildings from Minnesota that are just dripping with character. And it's because they are very, very much of their place. In the upper left, that is one of the old buildings from Chaska. Those bricks came out of the mud hole that's literally across the street from right there. So those are Chaska bricks. They were came out of the mud, fired across the street, and we build this beautiful building. In the upper right, I don't know if you guys recognize it, that is part of the campus at St. Thomas where they have like a really strong branding and the character of their buildings where they're all using um, a really dense Dola stone is what it's called. It's um, Casota stone, it's quarried down by Mankato. In the lower left, that is the city hall in Minneapolis, the original city hall. And it's made out of a not so well lithified red sandstone. I majored in geology when I was an undergrad, so I get very excited about these things. And in the lower left, with a real gamble on long-term uh, stability, they used the Platteville limestone to build this building in um, right along the river. So the Platteville limestone is what holds up St. Anthony Falls, and it is one of the least structurally sound stones I've ever come across. But they did it, and they made this really beautiful building out of this really low-quality building material. 
Now, the trick here is that all of these um, examples are really leaning heavily on materiality for their sense of location and identity. And the problem is, is we don't really have those resources available consistently because locally quarried stone tends to be very expensive. So one of the challenges that I am positing to this group is how can we make a local character in Hillcrest that doesn't rely on expensive stone facades in order to pull it off? We live I, in a I could very- say, As an example, uh, over at Beacon Bluff, we salvaged the limestone off of the buildings we demolished and it is now reincorporated into all of the business center monument signs for the entire park, all of the interpretive panel bases throughout the interpretive uh, plaza, et cetera, uh, an attempt to do something like Tiffany's talking about. Don't yes. exactly have that opportunity here, but just to get the wheels turning. Yes, and as Monty was mentioning before, we have to respect the requirements in the master plan. We have to respect the requirements of our uh, lead for communities certification, the district design manual, and um, a lot of regulatory agencies. But then the secret issue that we always have to consider is cost. So it is kind of one of those umbrella things that just can really make or break a project. And is it worth it to require a business owner to use locally quarried stone in order to build their building? it might make it impossible for them to afford to build anything at all. So we want to strike a delicate balance between requiring things that are of a high degree of excellence from a design perspective and things that are so excellent they get priced out of the market. Um, like I did when I thought I wanted to put copper gutters on my house and I was rapidly disabused of the notion standing in the aisles at Menards and being like, this is literally never going to happen for me. So I had to let that dream wither on the vine and decided to go in a different direction with some more affordable landscape interventions. So this is a really tricky one. It is, I think, the hardest part to uh, do. So as we go through our brainstorming efforts, we're going to think about Hillcrest at four different scales. The streets, the blocks, the lots, and the buildings. And each one of those has a set of regulatory requirements that applies to them. There's a lot of overlap there. So it is going to be the most efficient path forward to a lot of great design thinking to familiarize yourself with all of these resources. So on the next page, when we think about the streets, now the street layout is pretty much locked in, um, not only with the 2040 comprehensive plan and its desire to have a neighborhood node in this area, but there's also the master plan now, which is being submitted to the city council for approval. Um, there's very little wiggle room to change it and whatever change that might happen with the layout of the streets um, is really going to be dictated by the needs of utility requirements and whether or not there are market feasibility issues that need to be considered in the longer term. Um, there are a lot of district stormwater utility and traffic needs that are going to have a heavy influence on what happens in the streets, but there's a whole lot of things that we can talk about that's happening within the right of way that we can make recommendations on. The blocks, what's happening on the private property adjacent to all these right of ways, we have to understand what the zoning code says needs to happen in the transitional industrial zoning districts in the traditional neighborhoods one, two, and three. Those are the zoning designations that have been established for this particular neighborhood. Um, the blocks have been also strongly influenced by the city council ordinance that allowed the bonding approval for the Port Authority to acquire this property. And there are a lot of considerations from lead certification that we need to think about when it comes to blocks, most specifically when it comes to energy needs and how are we going to make this community operate on renewable energy exclusively. That's the big goal. Within those blocks, everything is going to be split up into lots and that has not been accomplished yet and will not happen until there are purchase agreements negotiated um, with the Port Authority and potential developers. And then buildings themselves need to be um, subject to local building codes and then the Arts and Employment District and all the sustainability requirements. So there are a lot of things that are already kind of underway 
and we'll be talking about the areas in which there are still so many decisions left to be made. So we can move on to the next slide, Andrea. And thinking about what these design standards might look like, there are, this is an example of what design standards can be illustrated as and really thinking about what's happening in the public realm, not just in the actual pri public property, but in those areas that you can see with your eyes while you're standing in public property. So there's this idea of like a borrowed view shed. So this interface between private and public space that we will want to make sure we're thinking about in great detail. So it's characterizing the neighborhood and making it the place that we want to be. Okay, so, so Andrea, yeah, we have a lot to say here. Yeah, and I was just going to kind of open this up first to say to ask if anyone has any reactions to to hearing about the urban design side. Um, and, and okay, that's fine. And one of the things that we were going to ask for with this particular meeting is that for all the meetings that we have on on um teams is that if we can have people with their cameras on so that we feel they kind of can see the interaction and and really get an idea for how people are reacting to the information it would be so extremely helpful um so i am going to go one back fr one frown can say a lot <laughs> exactly and what i'm going to do is really just set the stage quickly before we wrap up and assign the homework for the next meeting is to let you know that we've already done some community surveys and we've gotten community feedback. So we're not starting at square one from the standpoint that we don't know what community members want to see as part of the development plan. And so I wanna share this with you so that you can have some of these thoughts in the back of your mind so that we're honoring the input that's already come. To give you an idea, we um, surveyed over 500 people that lived within the three zip codes closest to the Hillcrest site. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to share my screen and show you what it is that we that we learned. Okay, so you know, I, I guess I'm I'm really basically going to be reading this, but when we talk to people about what they want for housing, we have 75% of the people that said they're interested in purchasing, 25% want to rent. Um, when we took a look at that housing, um, we kind of looked at the different options that would get us to the density that we needed. Um, the most common, 29% of people said, yes, I'd like a townhouse or a grow house. 14% wanted that duplex or triplex where they're the sole owner. So which means there is a wealth building opportunity to be renting the other one or two units. Um, another 9% said, I, I wanna be in a duplex or a triplex, but I want multiple owners. I don't wanna be responsible for the entire um, property. So then going into renting, this we thought was a little bit interesting, and I have a typo here, but 25% wanted a two-bedroom, 18% wanted a four-bedroom, another 18% wanted a three-bedroom, and 10% were looking at multi-generational units. Um, and multi-generational units came up in some of the conversations, and I do see that it was referenced as a possible ownership opportunity within the master plan. So um, things to talk about, and future residents want options that are affordable and they want neighborhood improvements that will increase home values and support family development. So to kind of take a look at the landscape design and, and some of those conversations, this is probably an overlap and um, to my other um, team members, let me know if I'm saying this incorrectly, but I think some of this conversation that we have with our group is going to overlap with what the outdoor spaces and public spaces will talk about. But when we asked residents what were the most important things they wanted to see to build that sense of community from the outside, number one, it was trail amenities. So things like benches, bike racks, and air stations. Number two, it was gardens with benches and water features. Number three was your typical park equipment, which I assumed would be number one, so that was interesting. Number four is gazebos and picnic tables. And number five was outdoor exercise equipment, which seemed to lean towards some of the multi-generational opportunities. I personally was in a number of meetings where there were people that were you know, over the age of 65 who were saying, well, what are you gonna have in the parks for me? Um, public art, that's another area. So what we're hearing people really wanna see in public art is something that reflects the neighborhood's rich culture. What that means we haven't dug into. 
Um, but that seemed to be top of mind. Also, 22% of people want art that's interactive and can be used as part of the public spaces. Um, and then 19%, again, assuming people just wanted it to be pretty, but really culture and interaction were more important. And then as we talked about to people about the sustainability components that are coming to the neighborhood, 24% looked at that as an ability to have, to be park, closer to parks and trails. 16% um, wanted to reduce energy usage and they wanted renewable energy options. 14% were looking for ways or how are we reducing chemicals and toxins. And 14% wanted a way to improve air quality. And then when we look at the job opportunities, we, you know, we're talking with neighbors and letting them know that there are jobs coming to the neighborhood. And, and what are the concerns that they have right now that we should be aware of? And so low wages was number one at 22%, which just making sure that people understand that when we're bringing a new business into a business center, we do have wage criteria and there is an assumption that they're going to be bringing in jobs or not assumption. There are requirements that they're going above and beyond a minimum wage and it's a livable wage. So for example, we recently, if anyone saw in the newspaper, we just sold a building um, that we acquired from the state of Minnesota that to soldier trucking and Monty, do you can you remember what their starting wage is? It's right in the round the twenty the twenty two dollars an hour starting out. I I want to say entry was eighteen to nineteen bucks like starting, but you can move from there to earn seventy to eighty thousand dollars a year within that company doing what you're doing with a typical driver's license. Exactly. So it and they're also and it was this was interesting is that we have 18 percent of people saying there aren't enough job opportunities and we had 17 percent saying there were staff shortages. So, you know, obviously that's a concern right now um, when people are asking, why are we still bringing jobs to St. Paul? Um, kind of the answer to that is that. Um, there is still a need, and I'm going to let Monty explain why there is still a need that there are manufacturing companies who are still looking for people to come to work and they are working within the neighborhood and they are finding people to fill their jobs. So for example, Bix, um, the BIC site where soldier trucking is coming in, they feel very strong in their ability to hire from within the neighborhood. And again, this is, I don't know, Monty, if you have anything to add to that, because that is really your expertise. We, uh, we've established a partnership over the last few years with something called the Eastside Funders Group, which is a group of philanthropic organizations, foundations you probably all have heard the names of. Um, but they've created something called the Eastside Employment Exchange, which is 12 Eastside workforce organizations. Actually, I think District 2 is one of those organizations that basically help organize the workforce development side of the equation. So when we can connect them with a business in one of our business centers, uh, we provide this opportunity for local hiring and local recruitment that otherwise businesses really struggle with. So there is this real mismatch of labor in our marketplace. Building these job dense buildings near a labor force rather than down in Shakopee, a la Amazon and Shutterfly, et cetera, um, makes a heck of a lot of sense from an urban and regional planning perspective. So that, that's the big picture. The, the, tight picture here uh, on the east side is even though when we hear news reports that the unemployment rate is only 4.2 percent what that means on the east side is over a third of the neighborhood in these census tracts is still living below the poverty line so uh there is a still a great need for economic development job creation job retention and that is something we uh stake our our livelihoods on and then a lack of diverse opportunities and you know as as um, we, we've talked about in other venues is that there aren't any large employers right now near Hillcrest. Um, there are a number that were that were in the area 50, 60 years ago that have left and have left a gap. Um, and there's also conversations about there, you know, there isn't a good sense of workplace racial equity, according to 9% of the people that took the survey. So that's another thing that's really being talked about. There is a workforce agreement that Monty and his team works on, is working on so that there are workforce criteria for the new businesses coming in. And they're working um, with a, a cohort of business professionals that are kind of sharing input, I believe, on how they can look at community benefits in giving businesses credit for bringing value to the community. So I don't know, Monty, if there's anything you want to add to that. 
No, I think we probably should move on to homework. Yep. And to homework, yep, exactly. So we are running about five minutes behind. I think, um, I think based on the fact that we started a little bit late. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna open this up to Tiffany to share the homework. So our homework is really, really open-ended. Our hope is that you guys spend some time over the next few days thinking about literally anything that inspires you or you feel like would be a good fit for Hillcrest, whether or not it's a building, whether or not it's a park concept, whether or not it's something you saw on a street one time, whatever it is, just put it, find a picture of it and then write a little blurb about why you think it's inspiring and where in Hillcrest you think it might work in. Where, how, why? You know, like if you find like a really beautiful fountain, you're like, I think that there should be a fountain right up on Larpenter that just says, hey, welcome to the Heights. We have a fountain. You know, whatever it is, dream big. So this is the point where we want to dream big and wide and loud. And then eventually as this process goes in, we will start to refine our big dreams and uh, temper them with a little dose of reality here and there until by the time we're done, we're going to be walking this beautiful tightrope between idealism and practicality. And we're going to end up developing a beautiful set of covenants that are elevating the design at Hillcrest while still being fully achievable by a variety of developers with a variety of budgets. Doesn't need to be a an essay, uh, but... No. Yeah, I'm a visual learner. A picture speaks a thousand words to me as the rest of these design oriented folks like you all. Um, but uh, images with a few bullets or a thought uh, would be really helpful to help us get inside your heads and start to ideate what this place will look and feel like. Yes. So I just typed my email into the chat so you guys can email me directly. And if you also want to copy Monty and Andrea, that would be great as well. Monty's email is MHH, I believe, right? Monty Mayo, MMH. Okay, I'll put yes. in the chat as well. Awesome. And Andrea. And everyone's email addresses should be listed on the calendar invite that yes. you have. That it's my through. hope that we can take your guys' ideas and integrate them into the presentations for meeting two and three. So for meetings two and three, we're going to be talking about streets for like a 45 minute chunk of time, the regulatory requirements that they're subject to, as well as the really detailed um, set of ideas of things that we can influence here. And if you guys come up with a precedent that applies to that street um, environment, that's where we would take a beat and talk about it and hear more from you about why you liked it. Um, and then the same applies for lots, uh, blocks and buildings. So we have residential spaces of varying densities. We have mixed use opportunities up by Larpenter. We have parks, trails and open space that we can talk about. And then we have those industrial parcels that are all do, subject to discussion. Do we want to talk about the node for two seconds just so they get the concept of the node? Sure. Uh, Andrea, can you throw the presentation back up? There's one intersection. The, the comprehensive plan specifically calls for not just nodes, but it calls for a node, meaning a singular place in the northern one third of the site. So we had to try to depict that and I'll show you right where it wants to be. Um, go back to the master plan site plan layout if you can, uh, Andrea. Um, and no one really knows what this node is, other than it's supposed to be public realm, community activation space. Uh, keep going. Yeah. I... There, there we, we go. go. Oh, so you see this weird little kind of Microsoft looking logo uh, that says, has the letter C labeled on it, right in the- It's like the Simon game. Yeah, uh, Simon Says, yeah. Yeah. So that's supposed to be the node. Um, densified, public, activated, fun, engaging, uh, you choose your own adjectives here. Um, but between this group and another work group that will kick off that's focused a little more on the open and natural spaces, um, we will we need to figure out what the node is. Um, and you know some of it will be activated by a building that has a first floor something. Um, but then there's all this other right of way space and public space. It will be one of the corners will be the public park, the city park. So 
think about the node. Uh, help us figure out what in the you know what the node is. And if I can just take a, just a couple more minutes too, I want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to be introduced to the group. And for those that came late, we do have a recording so that you can be introduced to the other members of the work group. So I'm going to start with Serenity. Serenity, if you can just introduce yourself to the group, tell us how long you've lived in St. Paul and what motivated you to be part of this work group. Um, I'm probably more newer. So I've been here, this is going on my second year. Um, and I was motivated to be a part of it because I really didn't know what was going on other than they were like, I just kind of got thrown in, I guess. <laughs> I, um, I, I stay not too far from Phelan, like, um, what is it like Dayton's Bluff more so, but, um, yeah, they're like, you know, you need to come and get familiar with the city because I really, it's, I'm new here, so. Thank you for joining us, Serenity. Great to have you. Thank you. And then Julie, are you able to go on camera and introduce yourself to the group? So, hi, I'm Julie. You know, I tried very hard to be on time. I was here and I couldn't figure it out. I'm not very computer savvy. So I was sitting there waiting to be connected and it didn't happen. So I'm afraid to do anything to get my camera on because it's uh -oh. I, I may drop the call. So next time I promise I will be right there, bright and shiny and smiley. <laughs> Perfect. And do you want to tell us how long you've lived in St. Paul and what brought you to this work group? So actually I live in Maplewood. I live right about probably a block and a half from Hillcrest Golf Course, um, right off of Howard Street. I've lived here for 28 years and the neighborhood means a lot to us. Um, it's been a very wonderful place to live and we, a, a lot of the neighbors are kind of concerned about the direction and the change and what it's gonna do to the neighborhood. So I really wanted to be part of it to hopefully be able to ease their minds and also ease our minds that this is gonna be a really good thing for us and the community versus a negative. Perfect, thank you. Um, so this adjourns our first meeting. So I, like I mentioned, we're going to put the recording on our website. I'm also gonna put a few other materials, including the master plan on the website. So my goal is to put that out tomorrow. Um, the notes will follow when they're ready. Um, I don't, and so if there's any other questions that anyone has, um, please let me know. I, I think most of you have sent me your um, contact information so that we can mail the gift cards to you to let you know those are actually coming directly from District 2 because, um, and it's through, through a grant through the East Side Funder. And so I don't believe that they're, they have staff available on Friday. So hopefully they'll be able to mail those out to you next week. If you don't have them by the next meeting, please let me know. Um, but we appreciate you taking time out of your, out of your busy schedules to, to be part of this. So thank you. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.